fantastic to, to meet you. It's a real privilege to hear your story. When did you first realize growing up that there was the presence of the Nazis in, in Czechoslovakia? So the first of all, I was nine years old when I was put on that train. Prior to that, we had been living in a small village um, in, um, near Moravia. We didn't move to Prague until 1937. Uh, My father had always been involved with politics, but the main memory of me is he being involved with a man called Thomas Mann. And Thomas Mann had been exiled from Germany and he suggested to the village council that they made him an honorary citizen uh, so that he could get a Czech passport. But it wasn't as simple as that. He had to have the permission of the Czech president. And he and the then local MP, and I have to remember the name, Mr. Kozak, went to Prague and he met with Benesch, the president, who immediately agreed and sent my father to Switzerland to offer Thomas Mann Czech passports, and this is in 1936, when clouds were already hovering, um, Jews were already being persecuted in Germany, but the, the Angels hadn't happened at that point. Uh, and then in 1937, we moved to Prague. 1939 came, and on the 13th of March, my father got a message that uh, the Germans would be in Prague any day by that time. They'd already occupied the Sudetenland. But I, as a child, was never aware of it. Um, and I, I mean, I know it's all happened, but I can't even remember it. And my sister at that point was three. And uh, my mother was a, a doctor, by the way, who was working in Prague. And my father at that point was a, an advertising manager for a medical magazine. Anyway, on the 13th, he was told by two men that uh, the following day when the Germans arrived, he would be arrested, that his, list, his name was on the Gestapo list, that he was to leave. And as far as I know, he left that night. And he was told to go to Berlin because he said nobody would look for him there. And for Berlin, he was to make his way back to, uh, make his way to England. Um, back in 1939, in May, my mother told us that we were going to go to England. And then on the um, 31st of uh, August, my mother and my grandfather took my sister and me to the railway station. And uh, at that point, my grandfather gave me this autograph book. And in the book, he wrote a message. Um, Remember to stay faithful to the country you're leaving, to your grandparents, and to your parents who love you very much. Prague, the 31st of July, nine o'clock in the evening, 1939. And he had the foresight to ask some of my aunts and uncles to also leave me messages. Because um, in 1942, when they were all being gathered together to be sent to Terezin and, and various camps, um, my grandparents and my, all, most of my relations were deported, uh, not to Terezin. There were hundreds of extermination camps in Poland which are hardly mentioned um, because these places, and I have the documents, they were taken there and they last a month and they get immediately murdered. And these were literally killing camps. So that's what happened to my aunts and uncles, my two cousins who were the same ages as my sister and me, so at that time they would have been 12 and 15, I think. Um, so really my memory, which I have very little, is my diary, is my autograph book. Um, and uh, that's basically the story of how, how I got onto the Winton train. When did you first hear about Nicholas Winton and what he'd been doing? Well, I came to England. Uh, I'm going to answer it in a rather uh, roundabout way. Um, picked up at Liverpool Street Station, brought to Ashton Underline, um, was sent away to a Czech uh, a refugee boarding school, married, went to France, worked as an au pair, married, and 40 years later, in 1988, 
Standing in the kitchen, the phone went. This is Esther Ransom. And my reply was, <laughs> I'm the Queen of England, because I really thought it was a, you know, somebody was playing a joke. I knew who she was. I knew her programs. Um, and that was the first I heard. And she said, and then she said, uh, what, what, what? I said to her, oh, she said, we'd like you to come down to, um, to London because we're going to bring this Mr. Winton who organized the trains uh, to the studio and to surprise him. And I was so taken back because I had honestly forgotten about my past. Um, because at that time, you know, Holocaust wasn't spoken about. We didn't really know about the camps. I was married to an Englishman with children. Um, and I said to her, oh, I've got five friends in London you can get in touch with, because I had been during the war at school with uh, some of the then children who had traveled on the train. She said, yes, she said, but we've got this list and we've picked out a few names, so, you know, we'd like one of you, we'd like you to come down. And so I came to the studio and I was met by Vera Gissing, um, who, who was one of my school friends, and I'd kept in touch with many of them all those years. And uh, Esther Ranson said, now you're going to sit on the front row, uh, and when this gentleman comes in, you're not to tell him who you are. And of course, it's now this very famous program, That's Life, that everybody has seen and can still see, where Nicholas Winton walks in already in his 80s. Milliner is on Nicholas's list, you see her there, but she is now Lady Milliner Grenfell Baines, and there she is. Milliner, I believe you still have the name tag you wore around your neck when you arrived as a little girl <laughs> at yes, Liverpool. I, I wore this around my neck, and this is the actual pass that we were given to come to England, and I'm another of the children that you saved. and uh, is completely overwhelmed uh, by, by us, by being told who we are. And of course, uh, Barbara Winton, who's written his life story, writes in this book that uh, when he tells his wife that he's been asked and asks her whether she'd like to come with him, she says, no. She said, it won't be very interesting I'll watch it on the telly, I'll see it far better than being in the studio. Uh, and they had no idea what was waiting for them. So she said that was the time when their lives were completely turned round by that particular evening. Uh, Vera Gissing, who was sitting on his left, had been searching for a long time to try and find out who had actually been responsible and discovered she'd only been living about 20 minutes away from him in, the, in a small town near Maidenhead. And so when that evening, he didn't stay very long. We were taken in a, a green room, uh, given some glasses of wine, but he left quite quickly after that because it was, it was just too much, not too much for him. And I certainly remember, remember that. Uh, and then the following week, that's when Esther Ransom, uh, who said, some of you are watching, please get in touch. She asked him back again, and the famous story is those of you who traveled on the train stand up, and you see most of the studio standing up. I, was, I didn't go down the second time, but um, these programs have been put together so that you get the very famous uh, you know, picture where all the people standing up. Who, and then he turns around and uh, um, really can't, can't believe it. Um, and later on, um, I have a another little film with him when we were st staying, we were at Esther Ansel's house. And uh, there was Vera Gissing and Nikki and I talking about this. And he said, you know, I now have a family of 5,000 because all these people who, who came uh, now have families and they have families. And the other thing that happened from that first day, every day he had a phone call, a visitor, a message, an invitation. Uh, eventually, he was invited to go to France, to New York, to Israel, and uh, um, now said not unknown, but un he didn't want it. 
he never, you know, uh, it, it wasn't a secret. People say that uh, he'd kept it a secret. He didn't. He said his children said they knew what he'd done, but he never talked about it. And it wasn't until this scrapbook came to life. And even then, um, he and his wife, they were, uh, Barbara says in the book, they didn't know what to do with it. And somehow, uh, Elizabeth Maxwell got hold of it. And Elizabeth Maxwell wrote to every address in, the, in, in those lists. And she received about 200 answers out of the 669 because it turned out that so many of those children were young and had been adopted, not just fostered, but had been adopted, had grown up, had forgotten, did not want to remember, had lost their parents, um, but 200 and odd answered. And this is why, this is how it was started. And um, Vera, who had been writing a book uh, called The Pearls of Childhood, in which she's saying, I'm looking for the man, was able to write in the book, you know, I, I, I found him. And uh, uh, well, the story goes on from there. How impressed have you been with the movie One Life starring Sir Anthony Hopkins, his performance as Nicholas Winton, and what was, was your involvement in it? Well, my first sewing, see, my first sighting of the film was a, a private view with just the family. Um, Nick Minton, uh, Barbara had sadly died by then, and his and the grandchildren. And if I tell you that Nick said to me, it's just like watching Pa, watching Anthony Hopkins. Um, I had been lucky enough to be invited to, the, uh, to one of the filming parts because he, Anthony Hopkins wanted to see some of the material that I actually kept. Uh, so I met him. and. Very, very nice, very nice man. And he was incredible because it was like looking at Nicky. Uh, he'd never met him. He'd seen, obviously seen films of him in photographs, but he'd captured, you know, even even the, the movement, the voice. Um, there were one or two sentences in the film, very pithy sentences, which some of the audience sort of laughed at because they thought it was funny, but that was absolutely Nicky. He would have come out with that kind of remark. Um, amazing. Um, what I think, because I knew the story, um, I found, I think people who'd, who've never heard of it, who'll see it for the first time, will take it for what it is. But in the story, it shows just the children from the camps being saved. In fact, um, N Nikki, saved other children and we were we were not part of the, um, the the family that had been thrown out of the um sudetenland area a lot of the a lot of these people were from the sudetenland because overnight when it was invaded they literally gave people 24 hours to pack up and leave their homes and that's where the refugees came in there were 200,000 of them sitting around prague there was nowhere, nowhere else to get out. They couldn't go out for uh, Poland, everything else was occupied. And um, they had heard about the kinder transport from Germany, but they didn't know what to do and they were desperate if they couldn't get out to get the children out. What do you remember about getting on that train with your sister, the journey, the tension, and saying goodbye uh, to family? Truthfully, I can't. As I say, my autographic book is my memory. I know it's happened. I can't physically, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm 94 and this has happened 80 odd years ago. And I did talk about this with a psychiatrist. And he said, it's not surprising that you cannot remember. Uh, I just know that it happened. Uh, I know that my sister was very silent throughout the journey. And it seems that she she also consulted, you know, psychiatrists about this. And she was told she was probably really very angry with her mother for sending her away. And uh, there is a photograph of her arriving in, in uh, Liverpool Street Station, wide-eyed, looking very, uh, probably, well, upset. 
And when you were taken in in England, how did your life change and, and evolve through, through the years initially with the family who took you in and then beyond? We were collected at uh, Liverpool Street Station by a gentleman called Roland Radcliffe and uh, who, with him we travelled on the train to Ashton under Lyne, which is just outside Manchester. Now, we had come from a very modern apartment and the Radcliffes lived in a terrace house, two up, two down, you know, front room, kitchen with a bath and a toilet in the yard and two, and two bedrooms. They had a 16-year-old daughter called Mary and because they didn't want to separate us, they sent Mary to live with her grandmother so that they could keep the two of us together. Um, I suppose I must have learned English quite quickly and very soon after that I have a photograph because we all went on a holiday to Rill in Wales. I gather I had no problem with food as people used to complain about English food. <laughs> yes, the one complaint I have I can tell you and we all had that because it's mentioned in a lot of memories is when we got to Holland and we put on this big ship to go to England. We were all given tea with milk. And all of us, none of us had ever had tea with milk. And the story goes, we all poured it out. But I very quickly drank tea with milk. Um, you know, uh, Mummy Ratcliffe, I mean, I remember, you remember food, uh, plum pie, Yorkshire pudding with syrup, um, playing out in the street, playing a game called kick cam. Uh, seeing my first pantomime, Goody Two Shoes. Seeing my first film, and you wouldn't believe this, this was, this was a Gilbert and Sullivan American film of, um, of um, uh, what, his name was Coco, what, what's the famous, the Japanese story, um, Gilbert and Sullivan. I'll, I'll, I'll have to take your word for it. Oh my goodness, um, the Mikado. And the Mikado. The Mikado, the Mikado. That was the first memory I really have of, of, of Ashton. And we were, we were very happy with the Radcliffes uh, until 1940, February, suddenly my mother walked in. And uh, again, to us it was a wonderful surprise, but we never asked any questions. And all the years, you know, afterwards, we were, our parents never talked about this, but my mother actually came via Norway uh, she had been given a message in Prague to go to the Norwegian embassy, this is February 1940, where a message, and I have the documents since then, a message had been sent to her. She was given um, an air ticket and a passport, flown to Oslo, and from Oslo flown to England. Now, to fly into England in 1940 was very rare. And two weeks later, Oslo was occupied by Germans. So I was one of the, or we were one of the very few children that actually had parents, parents who, who had escaped because most of the original kinder transport children that had come in, 19, in 1938 and most of the ones that I met never saw their parents again. You, you have said that you had family who did perish in the Holocaust, but You've also been talking about the family who, who made it to, to England. How, looking back, do you see your story? Is it one of, of, of fortune? Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, now these last, not really these last 10, 12 years, when everything has been talked about so much, um, I, we realise how lucky we were. And... Uh, I had another cousin um, in the Czech Republic who should have come on the same train. Uh, she was 11 years old at the time, and she was an amazingly gifted pianist. She was an only child, and she begged her parents not to send her, so they didn't. However, in 1942, uh, when the final solution was taking place, she and her parents were taken to uh, Terezin, um, by now she was 14 and she had been told by her music teacher that she should go and study in Paris because she was really a brilliant pianist. However, in Terezin, many Czech uh, musicians and composers were all also imprisoned 
and uh, she met two of them there. But then she was sent on to um, Auschwitz. She survived Auschwitz with her mother. She was then sent on to Belsen. She survived Belsen and she managed to get back to Prague. The teacher said that her hands, that she'd never play again. However, she was so determined, she practiced and practiced. And evidently, any Czech watching this film will know the name of Zuzana Ružičková because she became one of the greatest harpsichord players and a survivor of three concentration camps. And she was my cousin. So th there are about four relations at the moment living in Prague who are descendants of my maternal uh, grandparents' family. And back here, whilst you took in the realities of what had happened in the Holocaust, you made an, in an incredible life for yourself. Again, I suppose it was, it was luck. First of all, well, I was sent, my, my parents didn't want me to forget my own language. And the Czech government opened um, uh, uh, sort of grammar school um, in Whitchurch. It was called Hinton Hall. And it was very, very close to Chumley Park. And uh, the Czech army, when they came to England, were, were um, in Chumley Park. They were in, in, in um, intense, how would you say, you know, there. And some of the teachers were in the Czech army and they came to, to Hinton Hall, which was a decrepit old manor house. When I talked to children and tell them I was sent to boarding school, and they sort of think, oh, refugee in a boarding school. This was a place that was falling apart and there were about 80 of us. But the teachers, we were taught entirely in Czech. They had to write their own, um, own uh, instruction books. But I was a very poor pupil. I was only good at a few things. I was very good at singing, because eventually I wanted to be a singer. I was very good at sport. I was good at art. Um, I was dreadful at mathematics and totally useless at Latin. I really was a very poor pupil. Um, so that when the school ended in 1945 and uh, some of those children went back home to find no one there, I came back to, uh, to Preston, where we had moved to from Ashton My mother by now uh, was a doctor and she was allowed to now work in the local hospital. My father was an accountant and I had to go to work. And so I became a nursery nurse. Um, and I was there for three years, and I'd always liked the sound of the French language, because I do remember during the war, we used to listen to the radio a lot, and uh, de Gaulle, I used to, I remember hearing his voice saying Francais, Francaise, and so I decided to get a job in France as an au pair. So I put an advert in the Figaro, got a job in Grenoble, went to two French families, stayed in France for two years, learned French, came back and very quickly um, met a man called George Grenfell Baines, who was an architect, um, married him, and I suppose uh, lived a, um, a, a normal, well, normal, I had two children. George had been divorced, he had two daughters, which I, which I adopt, took on, and then I had two children of my own. Um, but during my married life, I had a very interesting life. And of course, you embraced one of England's most passionate institutions, that of football, and a certain Tom Finney. Well, I didn't embrace football, but I certainly embraced Tom because we knew Tom extremely well. Tom was, his firm was a plumbing firm, and my husband's firm was the architect. And in those early years, they actually, um, you know, worked together. So we, we knew Tom not as a footballer, but, but as a plumber. Um, and he became a good friend, and I have, I have pictures of him at, at home. So you lived a wonderful life uh, in England. Yes. Recent events, I'm talking specifically about the Hamas massacre of Israelis in southern Israel on October the 7th, has seen a rise in anti-Semitism in England and across the world. 
how upsetting has it been to see that development and how concerned are you about the world right now? I'm really concerned for my children and my grandchildren. Um, it, I think it was a shock to all the world what had happened. And I know the feeling today is running high, sadly to say, possibly against Israel. Uh, and I think, you know, 80 years after the fall, I don't think people realized what it is that the, these people, who they were, that, that, that had been murdered. Um, it's really difficult to, disc to talk about it. And uh, I think none of us know what's going to happen in the future. Um, but obviously being Jewish, and although my family are, I suppose not, are, we're, we're very close to the situation. Um, I, live in, I live in the north of England, and I haven't personally yet experienced any anti-Semitism where I am, but I know my friends have, people living in Manchester, people living in London, and somehow I cannot believe that this can be happening in England. Uh, because, you know, things like this don't happen in England. I mean, they did all those years ago, you know, when you think of mostly, but um, it's, it's very hard to talk about it, really. Every January, we mark the Holocaust with Holocaust Memorial Day. How important is it for people like yourself to continue telling your story all over the world and in schools to, to keep educating people about what happened so as to learn the lessons of the past? I have actually, for the last 10 years, as soon as, soon as we discovered Nicholas and as soon as the story came to light, I have been going to schools for, the, for, I know, for at least 10 years. And I know that, for instance, before COVID, I had visited 80 schools in one year. And uh, since then, now, uh, d uh, demands again are coming up. And it is most important. And I've received some wonderful letters. You know, I also talk to women's institutes, and I talk to, you know, adult, uh, adult groups. And they ask me, what do nine-year-olds you know, what sort of reaction do nine-year-olds uh, give you? And I have two letters that I carry with me that I read out to the adults. One of them is from an 11-year-old little girl who writes to say that she, had a, that she has a brother of three and she helps her mum sometimes to look after him. And she couldn't understand how I could look after my sister when I was nine years old. And that when she went on a week's camping holiday, she was homesick. And how homesick I must have been. And I sometimes say to the children, do you ever say I hate you to your parents? Which they put their hand up and they do. And she said, when you asked us, if ever we say I hate you, I cherish my parents a lot because I have parents to love. And these are her actual words. So what's your message then to anybody who might be watching this about how to conduct their lives, how to maintain hope where hope appears lost? What would you like to say to people? I, well, I suppose if ethics come into it. And uh, Nicholas used to say, you've got to learn to compromise, which today is going to be very difficult. This was one of, the, one of his messages. You know, he said that marriage is something of a compromise. I think the main thing is to, to accept other people's religions um, and to be, to live as good a life as you can yourself. Um, if that's the message I, could, I can give.